So what we're going to do um, first anyway um, today is to continue our discussion on the morality of abortion. So um, we're going to look first at what, as I think I said earlier, it's probably, I mean, sort of the most famous article on this topic and by some measure the most uh, widely read, widely anthologized philosophical article there is, namely Judith Jarvis Thompson's article called A Defense of Abortion. What Thompson does in that article is um, take attack, pursue a strategy strikingly different from the strategies on either side that we've looked at so far. I mean, so far, in effect, we've considered uh, pro-choice positions that take it in some way that the, um, the fetus is not human in whatever the relevant sense is, and so abortion is always okay, and pro-life positions that take it that um, the fetus is human or something like that in the relevant way, and so abortion is always wrong. Right? What Thompson wants to do is argue that even if the fetus is a person from the moment of conception, right? I mean, even if you sort of grant the pro-life person's premise, then abortion is still permissible, you know, in a wide range of cases. Thompson's is um, it's sort of a philosophical take on the standard feminist view according to which um, it's a woman's body so it's her choice. But the way she does the argument is in a number of respects um, oh, strikingly better than uh, popular presentations of such a feminist argument tend to be. The central problem, you get this on both sides of the abortion issue when you look at you know, popular presentations, the central problem with these popular presentations is they sort of tend to ignore what the other side says, right? So if you look at a sort of popular presentation of the feminist view, what you're liable to get is a person making the claim that it's a woman's body, so it's her choice, but just ignoring the fact, right, that the person on the other side is going to say, but look, I mean, it's not just the woman's body, there's another person in there. So, I mean, the first neat thing about the Thompson piece is she doesn't do that, right? She doesn't ignore what the other side's going to say. Instead, what she does is she begins her argument by expressing, working out rather clearly and carefully just what the argument the other side's likely to give comes to. So let's see, let me find this. This is... So, here's her sort of um, announcement that she's going to, for the sake of argument, grant the conservative premise, and then reconstruction of the conservative argument. This is the first full paragraph on 93 in The Right Thing to Do. She says, I propose then that we grant that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception. How does the argument go from here? Something like this, I take it. Every person has a right to life. So the fetus has a right to life. No doubt the mother has a right to decide what shall happen in and to her body. Everyone would grant that. But surely a person's right to life is stronger and more stringent than the mother's decide, right to decide what happens in and to her body, and so outweighs it. So the fetus may not be killed, and abortion may not be performed. So as I said, sort of far from just ignoring what the other side's going to say, Thompson there articulates it in this rather persuasive way, right? I mean, as she, as she goes on to say immediately afterwards, I mean, it sounds right, right, when you say it like that. I mean, it sounds right that you're going to say, well, if it's a conflict between a right to decide what happens in and to your body and a right to life, you know, the right to life will always win. So that's how the argument goes through. But then, of course, right, 
Thompson wants to argue it doesn't work, right? This argument, despite its initial plausibility, when you look at examples, is not a successful argument. The article really turns on a number of these analogies, right? And the first, the most famous, and the best is the one she introduces at this point, right? So, you know, just from where we are, having sort of set up this apparently convincing pro-life argument, she responds in the following, following way. Um, second full paragraph on 93, I'll abbreviate a little bit in places. It sounds plausible, but now let me ask you to imagine this. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. He has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known. But still they did it, and the violinist now is plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months. By then he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be un unplugged from you. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? No doubt it would be very nice of you if you did, a great kindness. But do you have to accede to it? Skipping a little bit. What if the director of the hospital says, tough luck I agree, but you've now got to stay in bed with the violinist plugged into you? Because remember this, all persons have a right to life and violinists are persons. Granted you have a right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in and to your body so you cannot ever be unplugged from it. I imagine you would regard this as outrageous, which suggests that something really is wrong with that plausible sounding argument I mentioned a moment ago. All right, so what's going on then with this analogy? Let's first sort of identify um, what exactly it's an analogy to, how the analogy works. So the hypothetical situation she here describes, what's it an analogy to? Go ahead. It's an analogy to the, the mother having an abortion, meaning like she's getting rid of a life that it has, I mean, that, that, that the mother should have a, a right to choose, you know, like should she, you know, maintain the life or not. And in this case, the guy being, I don't know, st stringed up with the violinist, it's like, even though it wasn't, you know, his decision or whatever, he's, you know, should he allow it to continue? Right. So you're quite right. It's an analogy to a, you know, a situation um, of pregnancy where the question of abortion would arise. Um, and so the, you know, the violinist is analogous to the fetus and the person who's been kidnapped is analogous to the uh, pregnant woman. So w what, what more specific circumstances is it analogous to? Yeah. It's analogous to rape because the woman doesn't have a choice here. Yes, the, that's right. She didn't have a conscious decision to have sex. Someone just kidnapped her and said, oh, by the way, you're going to support this for the next nine months of your life. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, strictly speaking, it's analogous to a rape case. You know, the Society of Music Lovers is analogous to, to the rapist. Yeah, that's right. All right, so then sort of to see... Um, kind of see how the argument goes, you want to kind of think as it were in two steps, right? Um, so look, I mean, it's clear what Thompson thinks about this case, right? I mean, Thompson thinks in the case she describes, in the hypothetical situation she describes, right, you are within your rights to unhook yourself. It's not like you have to. I mean, if you want to stay hooked up to the violinist, you can. But her point is, morally speaking, you're not required to. Morally speaking, you are allowed to unhook yourself. Right? So, how, so does anyone disagree with her moral view about that matter? Is everyone on board with her to that extent? Tends to be. With, I mean, I think one way in which this is sort of the most persuasive of these analogies is people tend to agree with it. Right? I mean, it's, it's, her analogy is rather persuasive. Then. So that's kind of a first step, right, in making the argument, right? Then, 
you have to ask, okay, so is there any relevant difference, any difference that makes a difference to the moral verdict between this hypothetical case involving the violinist, etc., and a real-world case of um, pregnancy through rape? Right? Go ahead. Well, uh, th in this situation, the violinist is already, he's already living. He's not being formed. Uh -huh. And in a rape case, the fetus, like, the question of when is it human comes about. And this, he's already human. So yes, so that is a difference. Um, that, though, is the kind of difference that doesn't hurt her argument, if you think about it, right? Because, look, I mean, the way she can argue it then is violinists are uncontroversially persons. If you're allowed to hook yourself from, unhook yourself from the violinist who's uncontroversially a person, you're surely allowed to, as it were, unhook yourself from the fetus that's only controversially a person, right? So, though that is a respect of disanalogy, right, it's not one that hurts her argument. Good, though. Um, yes? Uh, the uh, difference that I saw was uh, the analogy with the amount of, uh, I guess it would be the amount of trouble weighing on, in on the decision because the perception I get from this is that the uh, person is bedridden when, cl when in most cases, uh, a pregnant woman wouldn't be uh, encumbered as such. Yeah, so, okay, so th there's the question of just how sort of um, burdensome the uh, it would be to help the violinist as compared with how burdensome it would be to go through a pregnancy, right? Um, you suggest that as depicted the um, situation of the person in Thompson's hypothetical case um, hooked up to the violinist would be more burdensome, right? So then what you've got to do, I mean, if you think that, is, I mean, that is a relevant respect of disanalogy which might change your reaction. So then you've got to sort of change the case slightly to, you know, well, change the case to whatever extent you think is necessary to um, make the burdens of being hooked to the violinist appropriately analogous to the burdens of um, a normal pregnancy, right? And then ask yourself again, if it's like that, right, are you um, with morally within your rights to unhook yourself? So maybe you only have to spend, you know, eight hours a day there or something. Anything else if you want to try out about? Okay. Um, so look, I mean, if that works, right? I mean, if you agree with her about um, what you're within your rights to do in the hypothetical situation, and you agree that the hypothetical situation is appropriately analogous to a case of pregnancy through rape, then you're committed to the view that um, abortion is morally permissible in cases of rape. Um, now, it's important to see the ways in which agreeing with Thompson there sort of does and does not um, get you what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position. I mean, look, on the one hand, it certainly doesn't, in and of itself, get you all the way to, or even, you know, probably most of the way to, or something, what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position, right? I mean, that is, if the only kind of situation in which you thought abortion is, was morally permissible was a case of rape, a situation of rape, then you wouldn't have what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice view, right? So in that way, I mean, in and of itself, this analogy does limited work. But look, the other side of it, which is theoretically important, is the way in which it undermines the plausible sounding argument with which Thompson began, right? I mean, that plausible sounding argument, remember, was to the effect that whenever there's a conflict between a right to life and a right to choose what happens into your body, the right to life always wins. This case shows that that doesn't work, right? That's not true. Yeah? So, on the one hand, 
it, it's not sufficient to get you what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position. On the other, um, it does do something sort of theoretically quite important in terms of opposing, um, you know, attempting pro-life argument. Still, um, to get something oh, closer to what we'd ordinarily regard as a pro-choice position, you need something more. You need um, that abortion is permissible not just in rape cases, but in other sorts of cases. Right? Um, there are two other analogies that are worth looking at. One of them uh, we'll just take quickly because that's not really the one that's going to do the key work for Thompson. Right? The second sort of an analogy is one to a case in which the mother's life is endangered by pregnancy. Um, Try and find this one. Oh yeah. Um, so this is page ninety-six, starting about eight lines down. Thompson says. Suppose you find yourself trapped in a tiny house with a growing child. I mean a very tiny house and a rapidly growing child. You're already up against the wall of the house, and in a few minutes you'll be crushed to death. The child, on the other hand, won't be crushed to death. If nothing is done to stop him from growing, he'll be hurt. But in the end, he'll simply burst open the house and walk out a free man. Skipping three or four lines. However innocent the child may be, you do not have to wait passively while it crushes you to death. So there, um, you have an analogy, right, to a case in which a mother's life is in danger, right? And Thompson has, again, that, you know, I think the, the plausible, as they say, moral intuition, that you are within your rights to uh, you know, take the necessary steps to preserve your own life, right? Now, um, it's worth noting that, I mean, this case isn't the one either that's going to get you very close to what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position, right? Um, for one thing, these are, cases like this are now, I mean, they're quite w rare when Thompson wrote this 35, 40 years ago. They're rarer now, right? Um, for another thing, um, It takes a little work to even get yourself to see why sort of anyone would think that it's not okay to have an abortion in a case when your life's in danger, right? Because look, I mean, even if you bought the argument that Thompson reconstructs at the beginning, the argument that a right to life always outweighs a right to decide what happens in and to your body, that's not what's involved in this case, right? In this case, it's a right to life against a right to life, right? So you have to do a bit of work to sort of to understand why it would be that taking a pro-life position commits you to, you know, choosing the fetus's life over the mother's life, right? I mean, you know, you, there is a story here, right? There's a story associated with um, Catholic moral theology and the doctrine of double effects, some bits of which you can actually sort of figure out from some of what Thompson says early in the, in the parts of the article we've got in our anthology, but um, I mean, for, you know, first off, it doesn't seem like something you know the pro-life person is committed to, right? And agreeing with Thompson in this case certainly doesn't seem like it's you know it's going to get you close to what we ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position. Yeah?
So the analogy that is um, uh, most you know, liable to take you closer to what we'd ordinarily think of as a pro-choice position is um, the people seed analogy. That's a little further on, let's see. Um, so this is um, page 101. Mid, you know, big middle paragraph on 101. Um, starting just about the middle of that paragraph with a sentence that begins towards the right-hand side. Again, suppose it were like this. People see drift about in the air like pollen. And if you open up your windows, one may drift in and take root in your carpets or upholstery. You don't want children, so you fix up your windows with fine mesh screens, the very best you can buy. As can happen, however, and on very, very rare occasions does happen, one of the screens is defective, and a seed drifts in and takes root. Does the person plant who now develops have a right to the use of your house? Surely not. Despite the fact that you voluntarily opened your windows, you knowingly kept carpets and upholstered furniture, and you knew that screens were sometimes defective. <coughs> Someone may argue that you're responsible for its rooting, that it does have a right to your house, because after all, you could have lived out your life with bare floors and furniture or with sealed windows and doors. But this won't do, for by the same token, anyone can avoid a pregnancy due to rape by having a hysterectomy, or anyway by never leaving home without a reliable army. Okay, so what's going on in that case? What's that hypothetical situation? An analogy to. Yes. I guess using con contraception. Yeah, so it's it, it, it's an analogy to uh, you know pregnancy through contraceptive failure, given you know conscientious use of contraceptives. Yes. And let's, let's be quite explicit about this. So, um, so what does Thompson think in this case? Does she think? Does she think that the person plant, in this case, has a right to the use of your house? What does she think? Go ahead. I would argue that uh, she does not uh, argue that these, th that these uh, person plants really have a right to, use the, to be in the home, and that in the instance of contraceptive failure, she is arguing uh, a more pro-choice position as well. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, that, that's what she's doing. I, I mean, I, I, um, I want to be explicit about that because sometimes I, you know, experience suggests people don't, that doesn't come through so clearly from reading this. But yeah, that's what she aims to do. Right. Um, so, I mean, if this, if this analogy worked, right, you'd have something much more like what we'd ordinarily recognize as a pro choice position. Right. I mean, if you can argue that you know abortion is permissible in cases of contraceptive failure, then you've got you know, you've got a, a broader class of cases, and you've got a um, uh, you know something that I think we would tend to classify as you know a pro-choice view. Um, so again, if you want to approach this through the sort of through the analogy you've got the two questions right you have got the question okay so um, one is she right about what it would be okay to do in the hypothetical situation and two is the hypothetical situation appropriately like uh, the relevant uh, situation of pregnancy she wants to make it an analogy to right. so I guess start with the start with the first question I mean is she right that in the hypothetical situation she describes the person plant does not have a right to the use of your hats. What do you think? Yeah. I would say that she, she isn't right about that because if the person takes the risk 
uh-huh. by in turn by taking the risk he also accepts the consequences mm-hmm. so like for example say someone breaks the law mm-hmm. right they're also accepting that they have a chance of going to jail they can't just go to the cop and say no I don't want to go to jail they got to accept the consequences okay um yeah I mean so that's that's the thi- that's the thing that I mean, you, you put it nicely and that's the kind the, the the kind of thing that it's natural to say on the other side, right? Um, so Thompson's view is, you've taken all reasonable precautions, so you don't, you're not responsible, right? Um, your line, by contrast, is you knew there was a risk, you knew there was some possibility of this happening, so you, you are responsible, right? Yes? Um, I just, I failed to see how um, she qualified her argument that, that you, sh- that uh, you could live with bare f- floors and furniture or with sealed windows. She then says, but this won't do. I fail to see how she qualifies why that doesn't, why that doesn't do. She's basically d- completely discounting celibacy in the analogy. She's just saying, no, that's not going to happen. Why would you do that? Um, So, look, I mean, on, on her view, um, I mean, I don't think her view is that um, celibacy is impossible, right? It's rather that, um, uh, the fact that there's something you could have done and, you know, you knowingly undertook a risk um, doesn't mean that you are you know, sort of fully responsible for all the consequences. Right? Um, I mean, it, it's tricky to think about this example, I think, and it's. Um, well, let me say a couple of things about it. You know, because I, I think you, you, you're, you're thinking about just the right sorts of. Um, right sorts of things here. Um, I mean, one thing that's really, in, in a way, not germane to what you're pushing, right, um, but is, is worth, uh, worth saying a little bit is, I mean, there's a way in which this isn't a very good example, right? I mean, it's not, I mean, the way in which isn't a very good example, unlike the violinist example, is it involves a world um, very, very different from ours, right? I mean, the violinist example is as it were, set in a world that could be very much like our own, right? I mean, you can sort of kind of imagine the violinist story as, I don't know, the premise for a movie or something, you know, set in, you know, our world, right? I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it would be a good movie or anything, but I mean, you know, you can imagine it being one, right? Um, by contrast, the uh, people see example involves a world that's clearly very different from ours. I mean, there are these people seeds, you know, not just, remember, these aren't just plants, right? These are um, things that will grow to be people that are floating around in the air like pollen, right? And then you've got to ask yourself, okay, so what, you know, what's, how are we supposed to fill in the rest of the detail of this world? Is this, you know, sort of sexual reproduction of the kind that we're familiar with as well? I mean, what, what are, what's the, what are we supposed to make of and what are we supposed to imagine the background is in terms of how, uh, Beings that arise from people seeds, you know, relate to beings that arise from sexual reproduction, etc. Right? I mean, it's um, and the worry is that you sort of can't trust your moral reactions here because your moral reactions are going to be in part determined by how you fill in that background. And since it's so weird, there's a variety of different ways of filling in the background that might get you different reactions. Right? So on the one hand, for that reason, I think. Um, the example is not a great example. On the other, I mean, I think in the end it doesn't, that doesn't matter that much, because in a way you can abstract from the details of the example and you can still kind of see what the crucial issue is, right? So the crucial issue, it, it's this issue about risk and responsibility, right? So it's this issue, okay, so if you knowingly take a certain risk, right, um, are you fully responsible for the outcome or, you know, given that you've taken precautions to avoid it, right, are you less than fully responsible? Tricky to decide, right, but, 
I mean, there's, there's, there's a bit elsewhere in the article, I forget. I, I mean, I don't remember whether it's in the version of the article that we have extracted in our anthology, because we don't have all of it. We only get, you know, we've got substantial bits of it, but not all of it. Right? But there's a bit there where um, Thompson says something like, uh, oh, we require pregnant women to be good Samaritans in a way that we don't require people in other sorts of cases to be good Samaritans. Right? What she's doing there is she's, she's pushing for a kind of consistency. Right? She's saying whatever principles you accept um, in you know, cases of pregnancy and possible abortion have got to be principles that you're prepared to um, accept across the board. Right? And so I mean, surely that's the right attitude about principles about risk and responsibility here, right? So if you accept here the view, well, there was something bad that could have happened and you, you, know, you still went ahead, so you're fully responsible, right? You've got to embrace that in other cases. By contrast, if you're defending Thompson's line, you want to say, well, no, look, in other cases, we say if you've taken the reasonable precautions, you're sort of not fully responsible, right? Um, as I say, I find, it, I find it difficult to come up with um, completely adequately analogous alternative cases. Um, I mean, here's something that's not... Um, not fully adequate, but the kind of thing one might do if one's pushing Thompson's line, right? Um, so... Um, Let's suppose the following is true. Um, I mean, I think various of the assumptions here are um, reasonable enough, right? Uh, most of you, I do this during the year now, but I didn't, I, I biked in today, but I mean, I normally, during the year I drive, right? But, um, so most of you drove into campus today, right? You could have taken the bus. Would have been a pain would have taken much longer, right? Multiple connections, yeah, but you could have, right? Um, if you, I, I mean, I think the following is very likely to be true. If you take the bus, you're much less likely to be a party to a fatal road accident over which at the time you have no control than you are if you take a private car. That is, I mean, you know, if there were many more buses on the road, there'd be many less overall fatal accidents, right? Including fatal accidents of the kind that, you know, which are not caused by, you know, negligence or whatever at the time. They're just, you know, caused by sort of unavoidable features of road conditions, and there are, you know, two cars there where it's, you know, you don't want there to be two cars. There, right? So suppose all that's true, right? So then if you're defending Thompson, you say, look, Suppose you are involved in one of these accidents where someone else is killed, right? And there was nothing you could do at the time, and it wasn't like you were driving negligently, right? On the print, nonetheless, on the principle about risk and responsibility that Thompson's opponent wishes to put forward, you are fully responsible for that death. Because look, there's some, there was something you could have done, and you knew what it was, and if, had you done that something, you would have made this bad outcome significantly less likely. Sure, it was very burdensome and all, but you could have done it, right? N knowing that, you didn't do it, right? So, so then there's no sort of, you know, getting out of this as, um, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know what the category, you know, accidental death or anything like that, right? I mean, because that, that's letting you off the hook, right? I mean, there's some, you know, you knew, right, that there was something you could have done and you didn't do it. You persisted in driving on the road in your private vehicle. So see, so see, if you're pushing Thompson's line, you say, and that shows that we don't accept the sort of the opponent's principle about risk and responsibility in other cases. But I mean, I don't say, I mean, I can think of things that are wrong with the example I just gave you, but I don't say it's perfect, right? But you, you see the idea, right? The idea is what you want to do is generalize. What you want to do is ask what exactly is the principle about risk and responsibility that Thompson's accepting? What exactly is the principle about risk and responsibility that the opponent's accepting, and which of those um, do we, in fact, believe? You know, um, 
in general, you know, n not with particular relation to uh, cases of uh, pregnancy. Yeah. But it, for that argument, isn't there a discrepancy between the extreme, the extreme extremeness of uh, of having sex and getting pregnant through um, a, like a breaking condom versus driving on a road and uh, having some catastrophic accident that happened that you had no way uh, no way of knowing about or preventing and killing someone else? Isn't there isn't there a, a large uh, gap between those two analogies um well i mean maybe there is although i don't i don't i mean i'm not sure that you've said why there is yet um i mean i mean look he, i mean here's one difference a person can point to right um so i mean so they can say okay so the thing is in the I, I have a, I can yeah go. okay the, the point of contraception is to not form a baby and whereas mm -hmm. the point to driving is not to not kill someone you just the point of driving is to go from point a to point b so if something happens along those lines it's it's the same as like if you're having sex you know what's to stop what's to stop like a bullet from a stray bullet from flying through the window and killing the person you're having sex with it's kept that was kind of out there, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I don't know. Let's, I mean, let's see. It's all right. It's all right. Um, uh, so, so look, um, so you want to present the most distant analogy. I mean, if, I, if I'm defending this, I guess what I do is I say, look, um, in both cases, you're talking about sort of adopting a policy, right? So you adopt the policy of driving. It's not the only way you could you know, do what you need to do, get to class or whatever, right? Um, but it's, um, you know, much the most pleasant and convenient way, right? Um, similarly, I mean, the various policies you could adopt with respect to um, sexual activity, right? Um, if you're not currently wanting children, right? And um, one of those is, you know, a policy of complete abstinence, but, you know, much more pleasant and convenient to adopt the policy of, um, you know, sex with contraception, right? So in that way, you know, the claim will be there's, there's an appropriate analogy, right? And, you know, in both cases, there is the thing that you could have done, the policy that you could have adopted, which is, you know, considerably less pleasant and convenient to go forth, but is available. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's all good what you, what you guys have been pushing. It's, um, I mean, I, you know, I wish I could come up with a nice, I, I, I don't have something that's sort of a perfect, to my mind, analogy in this case. Um, but look. What I think is, this is, I mean, this is really what um, the, success of Thompson's strategy hinges on, right? Um, so if the people see the analogy, or given what we said really probably better put the kind of principle about risk and responsibility that it involves, that Thompson wants to push. If that works, then her it does look like her strategy gives you a different way of arguing for what's genuinely a pro-choice position. By contrast, I mean, if the position on the other side is right, then sort of the title of Thompson's argument is um, really misleading, right? If you know something like the people seed analogy or the underlying principle of it doesn't work, then in a um, you know in a funny way, what Thompson really ends up doing is sort of helping the other side, right? Because um, oh, lots of people who are basically pro-life tend to want to make exceptions for rape cases. Right? And if the only one of Thompson's analogies or arguments that works is the violinist one, then in effect what Thompson has done has, is to sort of show the pro-life person how to make the one exception that that person wants to make. Right? But what she won't have managed to do is to um, defend what we ordinarily think of as a 
pro-choice position. Yeah, question. Oh, um, I was just wondering uh, when, if, if if you're looking at a case where a baby happened because of failed contraception, mm -hmm. would you not also have to look at the reason that contraception failed, whether it was just something spontaneous that you couldn't have predicted or whether you were using like a condom that expired three years ago? Sure, right. So look, um, that would matter and, and it's so I mean, it's, it's a feature, right, of Thompson's kind of argument that um, it doesn't look liable to get you a kind of across-the-board pro-choice position, right? Um, so suppose the, the argument involving the sort of people seed case worked, right? So that's the, you know, the conscientious contraceptive use argument, right? But then, in effect, you say, well, okay, so what about the somewhat less than conscientious contraceptive use, right? What, the, what about the, you know, not, you know, uh, people who use contraceptives most of the time, or, you know, uh, you know, expired contraceptives or whatever it is. Does, I mean, does that still work? What about the, um, the, um, you know, people who are sort of culpably ignorant about the effectiveness of the form of contraceptive that they were using? I mean, would it be okay in that case, right? Um, this, I think, is a, uh, is a point at which um, uh, Thompson, fight, you know, Thompson can't quite bring herself to um, embrace the consequences of her strategy of argument, even if the strategy of argument is basically successful, right? Because, I mean, surely as you push the different cases in the way that you're suggesting, you'll come to a point where you'll say, no, you know, abortion's not permissible in that case, right? I mean, indeed, she herself gives an example that very much looks like one of those, right? I mean, she talks at one point about the person who um, wants to, who's seven months pregnant and wants to have an abortion in order to avoid having to postpone her trip to Europe, right? I mean, that looks like a case of um, sort of an impermissible abortion, if ever there was one, right? So you would think Thompson ought to say, no, no, that's wrong, right? And, and as I say, she can't quite bring herself to say that. What, she, what she's rather striking, what she says is, okay, that would be morally indecent, she says, but she's got this sort of category of moral indecency and she can't, you know, quite bring herself to say that it's um, impermissible, right? Um, I mean, Thompson's a clever philosopher and, you know, no doubt there's more of a story to be told about why she's, you know, why you might want to say it's indecent but still permissible. But still, you know, I can't help thinking that, you know, at that point you've kind of got a, um, you've got a tension between her argument and the position with which she starts, right? So she starts as someone who has, you know, strong commitment to a pro-choice position and, you know, she's, um, and so she's, you know, refuses to accept that the argument strategy she's employing isn't going to get you such a <coughs> across the board pro choice position right so i mean so it's i mean i think properly run you've got to admit that some of the cases like that extreme one uh she describes the right verdict given her argument strategies no it would not be okay in that case good and anything else about the, the Thompson piece? All right, so this, this is probably a good point at which to take a, take a break then. We'll come back and talk about Marquis.